Hey Nick, so this is your surprise. Um, I know you're stuck in bed, so um, my rather brilliant idea to alleviate your boredom um, was actually to read to you. Uh, this one thing I rather enjoyed whenever I was sick was being read to, and um, I know you're bored out of your mind, so this is, I guess, one way for you to see my face, hear my voice, and, um, and something to occupy your mind as well. So, because uh, I know when you're sick, it's not always, uh, you know, don't always feel motivated to pick up a book and, and read. It might be a little bit easier just to listen to a story. So, I was uh, searching my bookshelves for the appropriate book to read. And, um, and I found not a, every book, not every book is a read aloud book. Um, so, I finally decided on one that I thought was pretty universal. And it is Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. So I'm going to go hopefully chapter by chapter. And I hope you like it. Okay, so Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Chapter 1. The Boy Who Lived. I get the microphone in the right place. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious, because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Grunnings, which made drills. He was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large moustache. Mrs. Dursley was thin and blonde, and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful, as she spent most of her time craning over garden fences and spying on the neighbors. The Dursleys had a small son called Dudley, and in their opinion there was no finer boy anywhere. The Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret, and their greatest fear was that somebody would discover it. They didn't think they could bear it if anyone found out about the Potters. Mrs. Potter was Mrs. Dursley's sister, but they hadn't met for several years. In fact, Mrs. Dursley pretended she didn't have a sister, because her sister and her good-for-nothing husband were as undursleyish as it was possible to be. The Dursleys shuddered to think what the neighbors would say if the Potters arrived in the street. The Dursleys knew that the Potters had a small son, too, but they had never even seen him. This boy was another good reason for keeping the Potters away. They didn't want Dudley mixing with a child like that. When Mr. and Mrs. Dursley woke up on the dull grey Tuesday our story starts, there was nothing about the cloudy sky outside to suggest that strange and mysterious things would soon be happening all over the country. Mr. Dursley hummed as he picked out his most boring tie for work, and Mrs. Dursley gossiped away happily as she wrestled a screaming Dudley into his high chair. None of them noticed a large, tawny owl flutter past the window. At half-past eight, Mr. Dursley picked up his briefcase, pecked Mrs. Dursley on the cheek, and tried to kiss Dudley goodbye, but missed, because Dudley was now having a tantrum and throwing his cereal at the walls. <laughs> Little tyke chortled Mr. Dursley as he left the house. He got into his car and backed out of Number Four's drive. It was on the corner of the street that he noticed the first sign of something peculiar. A cat reading a map. For a second, Mr. Dursley didn't realize what he had seen. Then he jerked his head around to look again. There was a tabby cat standing on the corner of Privet Drive, but there wasn't a map in sight. What could he have been thinking of? It must have been a trick of the light. Mr. Dursley blinked and stared at the cat. It stared back. As Mr. Dursley drove round the corner and up the road, he watched the cat in his mirror. It was now reading the sign that said Privet Drive. No, 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 looking at the sign. Cats couldn't read maps or signs. Mr. Dursley gave himself a little shake and put the cat out of his mind. As he drove toward town, 
he thought of nothing except a large order of drills he was hoping to get that day. But on the edge of town, drills were driven out of his mind by something else. As he sat, on the, sat in the usual morning traffic jam, he couldn't help noticing that there seemed to be a lot of strangely dressed people about. People in cloaks. Mr. Dursley couldn't bear people who dressed in funny clothes. The get-ups you saw on young people these days. He supposed this was some stupid new fashion. He drummed his fingers in the steering wheel, and his eyes fell on a huddle of these weirdos standing quite close by. They were whispering excitedly together. Mr. Dursley was enraged to see that a couple of them weren't young at all. Why, that man had to be older than he was and wearing an emerald green cloak. The nerve of him. But then it struck Mr. Dursley that this was probably some silly stunt. These people were obviously collecting for something. Yes, that would be it. The traffic moved on, and a few minutes later Mr. Dursley arrived in the Grunnings parking lot, his mind back on drills. Mr. Dursley always sat with his back to the window in his office on the ninth floor. If he hadn't, he might have found it harder to concentrate on drills that morning. He didn't see the owls swooping past in broad daylight, though people down in the street did. They pointed and gazed open-mouthed as owl after owl sped overhead. Most of them had never seen an owl, even at night-time. Mr. Dursley, however, had a perfectly normal, owl-free morning. He yelled at five different people. He made several important telephone calls and shouted a bit more. He was in a very good mood until lunchtime, when he thought he'd stretch his legs and walk across the road to buy himself a bun from the bakery. He'd forgotten all about people in cloaks until he passed a group of them next to the bakers. He eyed them angrily as he passed. He didn't know why, but they made him uneasy. This bunch were whispering excitedly, too, and he couldn't see a single collecting tin. It was on his way back past them, clutching a large doughnut in a bag, that he caught a few words of what they were saying. The Potters, that's right, that's what I heard. Yes, their son Harry. Mr. Dursley stopped dead. Fear flooded him. He looked back at the whisperers as if he wanted to say something to him, some, something to them, but thought better of it. He dashed back across the road, hurried up to his office, snapped at his secretary not to disturb him, seized his telephone, and had almost finished dialing his home number when he changed his mind. He put the receiver back down and stroked his moustache, thinking, No, he was being stupid. Potter wasn't such an unusual name. He was sure there were lots of people called Potter who had a son called Harry. Come to think of it, he wasn't even sure his nephew was called Harry. He'd never even seen the boy. It might have been Harvey or Harold. There was no point in worrying Mrs. Dursley. She always got so upset at any mention of her sister, and he didn't blame her. If he'd had a sister like that, phew. But all the same, those people in cloaks... He found it a lot harder to concentrate on drills that afternoon, and when he left the building at five o'clock, he was still so worried that he walked straight into someone just outside the door. Sorry, he grunted, as the tiny old man stumbled and almost fell. It was a few seconds before Mr. Dursley realized that the man was wearing a violet cloak. He didn't seem at all upset at being almost knocked to the ground. On the contrary, his face split into a wide smile, and he said in a squeaky voice that made passerby stare, Don't be sorry, my dear sir, for nothing could upset me today. Rejoice, for you know who has gone at last. Even muggles like yourself should be celebrating this happy, happy day. And the old man hugged Mr. Dursley round the middle and walked off. Mr. Dursley stood rooted to the spot. He had been hugged by a complete stranger. He also thought that he had been called a muggle, whatever that was. He was completely rattled. He hurried to his car and set off, set off for home, hoping he was imagining things, which he had never hoped before, because he didn't approve of imagination. This is part one of chapter one.
of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Now I'm not sure how what the the length limit is on these uh, videos because I'm going to upload this to YouTube. So I'm going to set ten minutes as the uh, as the approximate length of each video, and I will take up I'll, I will pick up where I left off in this book um, in Chapter One, Part Two of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and I will send you the link for every video that I make. So this has been chapter one, part one of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone.